Hey, everybody. Welcome to the three podcasters walk into a bar. You ever had that goofy uncle at a birthday party or Christmas vacation or something like that? And he walks up and says, these three people walk into a bar and everybody runs for the couch. Well, <laughs> I happen to have two other guys and it's this is three podcasters, brothers of the bond of podcasting, and we cover energy. First around the corner is the David Blackman. David is a Forbes contributing author, and he has got his own sub stack. He's on two other podcasts. He's a man about energy. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, man. This is always fun every Monday. I always look forward to it. we got a lot to talk about today. Uh, we do. And by the way, uh, our <laughs> numbers are going through the charts off of this. So actually, we are funny. So, okay, uh, coming around the corner, we got the head honcho over there. He's not the head honcho, but he's the one doing the work. So he is, you know, we're going to talk about that one here later on, but uh, he's an EMP operator over at Pecos Operating, and he's got the crude truth. Uh, all you have to do is search for crude truth truth and he's number one on google that tells you what kind of animal he is out there uh putting that thing out there so anyway welcome rt oh thank you uh thank you for having me and yes uh we do have a lot to talk about today and uh i just want to say first and foremost to all our viewers and listeners be sure to like subscribe and leave us nothing but five star reviews because uh David can't handle the the four and a half. I, yeah, I, I don't take criticism well at all. <laughs> Hogwash. You were uh, you were picking some fights last week, but I'm I'm going to leave it at that, <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say. You know, we look for trolls. I live for trolls, and I, you know, <laughs> I, I absolutely love. Bring it on! I I love comments. I want to talk to anybody. And uh, anyway, I got two things that I kind of want to tee up. I want to tee up for one of our future discussions coming around the corner. I put out on my sub stack. Wow. I have to pretend to be like RT and, <laughs> and David, you know, I'm stealing their material, but I've got a couple articles that I want to tee up for next week. And that is the movement of the petrodollar to the Petro one uh, in China. And there is about 16 different things that are coming around the corner that are impacting this in the Biden administration guys. I think they're just handing it to Saudi Arabia, Russia, Iran, Iraq, India, and it's moving away. And that's going to be devastating to the U.S. So just want to tee that up. Substack, the energy news beat, substack.com. Okay. That being said, David, you are a nut. Absolutely. Not only a troll hunter, you absolutely had one. We had a little while ago, it was a guy on Substack. He was a uh, really big author. He's the one he's been around for 50 years. Beautiful guy said that the Nord Stream was blowed up by uh, the U.S. Norway came in and everything. Yeah, Seymour else. Hirsch. Yeah, Seymour Hirsch. Thank you. Hirsch. And, yeah. and it was just a hoot. We're all sitting here kind of going, that was some detail. Even if it was false, <laughs> if it was right, who knows? But David, your absurdity of the day, which is huge. Tell us about that. I about fell out of my chair. Yeah, so over the weekend, folks, you can go read it at the Wall Street Journal website. Uh, it's an op-ed that ran actually on Friday, the 17th of March, that uh, is detailing the the uh, investigation. The international community has been investigating, trying to determine who blew up the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines, as if it's any great mystery. We, I think we all know at this point who it was. Um and uh, they've, they're now focusing, according to the Wall Street Journal, on six unidentified individuals who leased a yacht to cruise around the Baltic Sea during the month in which, or month before, Nord Stream, the two pipelines were blown up. And uh, they even published a map of the route that the yacht took with these six individuals, mysterious individuals on it, as they label them. Um, and never one time did that yacht come within 25 miles of the Nord Stream pipelines, okay? 
I mean, it's it's just the most ridiculous and absurd story you've ever read in your life. Uh, but the claim apparently is that these these boaters just jumped off the boat and swam 25 miles with bombs strapped to their back and managed to somehow go down 260 feet down below the surface, which is where those pipelines are. Yep. Okay. That's decompression time, folks. That's that's uh, an incredibly deep depth for scuba divers to dive that, that you know, unless they're Navy SEALs, which uh, one person who responded to my Substack piece on this said, it's got to be somebody with that kind of training and blew those pipelines up it, without the boat ever coming within 25 miles of them. And it, it, this is the most ludicrous. It's, it's as if these people want to put out the most ridiculous and absurd story possible just to insult our intelligence and for no other reason. And it's it's uh, unimaginable to me, number one, that anybody who writes for the Wall Street Journal would have written this story. Right. And number two, that any editor would have approved the story. And number three, any publisher would have published the story. It's it's a an all-time low in the annals of American journalism. You can read it my take on it anyway, at uh, blackman.substack.com. And that's my commercial for today. That was a hoot. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and RT, that guy was so good. He was talking about the bends. And even only if they made it halfway, they yeah, had the commenter, to have the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they had to have the equipment. They would have just died. And uh, Lloyd Bridges out of Sea Hunt, this tells you how old <laughs> I am, could not have made the 25 mile ride. <laughs> and then even Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and the Nautilus couldn't have made it either. I mean, they would have just absolutely failed too. So, our team. I, I think, uh, you know, uh, when I read this this morning, and, and I do my best and, uh, to really read those energy absurdities because it's almost like uh, some of the, I, I compare it to when I was a young guy, young kid and watched the Saturday Night Live in the early nineties and didn't understand it. Then you go back and rewatch and you just laugh even more. So <laughs> it's fun to read um, David's take on it. Then go read the actual article and be like, what? Like, and then you just go back to David's article and you just laugh. And all I could think about, and you know, I'm not that old Stu is that mm -hmm. this writer must have been watching James Bond's 1963 Thunderball the oh, night before yeah. and goes, crap, I need my, my articles to do by 10 o'clock <laughs> tomorrow morning. What am I going to write about? And it comes up with this elaborate, I mean, that's exactly what I thought of. But if anybody there watched the great scenes from Thunderball with all these awesome underwater Oh my and, God! Yeah, uh, all this equipment that they use, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. And there's, uh, a, there's no way, RT. <laughs> what they're that is doing so funny. Is, I almost actually wrote that in my piece. No, you did not. I, I should have. I should have included it. <laughs> that actually but, popped into my mind. But it, it, it's just the clear. <laughs> it's just another example of, of you said. Look, the Wall Street Journal is something my father uh, still has the actual. Wall Street journals from the day that I was born, January, you know, and uh, because, and, you know, just as a memento of the day and it has it for me and all my brothers. And that's a real newspaper. Okay. I said it used to be, yeah. It, uh, okay. Thank you. And <laughs> so for them to write this article, I just, I'm, I'm dumbfounded. I'm like, you know what, what, you know, I, it just, I, I'm speechless. There it is. I'm speechless with, 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 with this article. It's like, guys, we, we probably know who did it. I don't know why we're still worried about it at this time. Um, there, there's nothing good that could come out of it other than more finger pointing, which, you know, when you got a finger pointing at you, you got four pointing back at you, right? Isn't that what they say? Yep. So there's really no need to continue this. Let's just work on getting Germany natural gas that they need to continue to survive. Um, and, and prosper if they're even doing that right now. So, what, yeah, what kind David, of hand do you have our right story? You got one pointing at somebody else. How in the hell do you have four pointing and back at you? I can't three fingers. Three, thank fingers. you. I'm sitting here going, I, my hands are all busted up. <laughs> I mean, they don't bend this way because I broke them so many times and my thumb goes up in the air because I can't move it. For our podcast listeners, I'm up here with a crippled up hand. 
and I can only get like three <laughs> coming back to me. And I did go to OSU, but I can count to three. Well, people know what I meant. They know what I meant. Anyway. Well, you know, the reality is that there's only two countries that could have pulled that off, right? That had the assets and the personnel in the region when those pipelines blew up, and that's the United States and Russia. So, I mean, that's it. That's it's either one one of those countries or the other. It's not some half dozen tourists renting a yacht to float around the Baltic Sea. Okay, and everything else is just a distraction. I, I, you know, I heard that Ted Turner is actually the one that rented that um, yacht, and then um, uh, that's what I heard. But you know, <laughs> America, George Cup. Soros, that was actually on the yacht. So I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Take that, Wall Street Journal, and do something. Okay. Oh. Well, RT, you had another great article, and I think it was, uh, I think uh, Gilligan and uh, the Skipper, too, uh, actually were the ones that. Was uh, Lovey there? I hope Lovey was there. Yeah, oh, I goodness. think so. I think um, so. Okay. Um, uh, RT, you had another great story. Oh, I did. You know, um, I, I really wanted to focus today. Uh, I, I have a great article on my Substack. Uh, that I haven't even released out into the social media verse yet today, uh, talking about the good old horrible coal industry and how it is that Pakistan is now getting ready to build a new coal power plant. And this is going to be financed by China. They're going to finance it and build it. And guys, I think my new one of my new sayings for 2023 is going to be: I understand that we got to when you want to make a change, you got to look at yourself in the mirror and make a change. Okay, when you want to make an impact on the world, you start with yourself and then you go from there. I get it. Okay, but when the United States is the cleanest, best place, people are dying to get here. Our drilling rigs are cleaner, our rules and regulations are second to none. We are doing everything in our power to keep this world clean uh, and, 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 um, and, and fight climate change. So why do we need to continue to bend over backwards for a country like China that only continues to add more coal power plants, not only to their country, but to other countries in the world, not to mention that they are doing their best right now to do a hostile takeover of the petrodollar by taking it to the petro yen. Guys, this is our energy security, and they are attacking it because they know that if they can weaken our energy security, then the United States will be weak, no matter who the president is, whether I think this president is weak or not. <laughs> Well, we're, I mean, we don't need any help becoming weak on energy. Our, our own administration's doing that to us. But Pakistan's motive, you know, they, they were trying to convert their coal plants to natural gas, just like we've done in the United States. That's really dramatically cleaned up our air over the last 20 years. But with the crisis in Europe, Europe began buying up all the LNG cargoes that had previously been going to Asia. And Pakistan has literally attempted to continue buying liquefied natural gas cargoes and hasn't been able to buy any because Europe is buying them all up. And so Pakistan's government a month ago announced that they're going to go back to coal. They're going to convert, uh, unfortunately, their natural gas plants back to coal because why? Because they have to feed their population and they have to keep the lights on. And you can't do that with windmills and solar panels. And I mean, you can, but only for a few hours a day. And so they're going to go back to what's reliable and, and affordable and available. And China's going to help them finance the, the, the project, just as China is doing all over the world, in South America, Africa, everywhere. And uh, we're doing nothing in the United States uh, in any real way to, to try to uh, encourage them to take a different route because our government knows that that's what they have available to them. You know, David, you are dead on uh, uh, brilliant. And I just interviewed, uh, I think on Thursday, Osama uh, Rizzi. Rizzi, yeah. yep. Uh, he Great is guy. A super guy. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they got a 70% inflation right now. 
they had an LNG carrier that was canceled and stolen from someone else. I believe it was stolen for Germany possibly, and they didn't get it. So they don't have the natural gas. They do have everything. Their energy prices are up 110%. They, everybody cooks off of propane uh, barrels. And they said, it's like bombs going around. And I think we even talked about on three episodes before where they were carrying natural gas in bags and the kids in balloons, balloons, plastic balloons. balloons. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, but I mean, you say it's insane, but it's what they have to do to survive. Yeah. Yeah, I'm releasing his podcast, uh, I think Wednesday. So this one, I think will be out at the same time. (laughs) Good. Good. Um, Good. So well, Osama's a brilliant guy. I mean, really smart. Love him. Understands everything that's happening, not, not just in Pakistan, but but throughout that region of the world. Right. And I, I I interviewed him, you know, last month too, and I'm planning on doing it again because he's just a tremendous source of information that we all should be listening to and reading. So. There you go. I steal your stuff. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I want to highlight something that David said that is uh, the truth, or should I say the crude truth, that since natural gas has become a major player of a energy source, we have cleaned up our air and our environment tremendously. Yep. Natural gas is something that has done great here in America. Um, we're, we're slowly converting, you know, uh, uh, buses to natural to liquefied natural gas and um, obviously we have a lot of people that uh, use it for heating and, and for their cooking as well so it's just something that really does a great job and uh, bringing it back here uh, to the United States um, you know they want to tax the natural gas and methane emissions you know that's something that's new um, another article that I, I featured this weekend, um, was from Dr. Ed Ireland. Um, I think this is actually the second week in a row that I've, uh, I've, I've, I've featured a, an article from him. He's just another one of those guys that's been um, in the industry of natural gas for over 20 years. And um, he really had a great article. And it was basically, if you want to get rid of something, tax it. You know, he, he quoted the great Ronald Reagan, is that if you want less of something, tax it. If you want more of something, subsidize it. And that really, uh, that should really resonate with every American everywhere on what we're subsidizing right now, which are green, renewable green energy movements. Um, But this article, I really recommend it. He really goes into detail about how this president, who has 50 years of, of experience in politics, nothing else, him and his lawyers do a great job of, of, honing in and attacking the fossil fuel industry by fines, taxes, fees, burdensome additional regulations. So they're not doing anything to help out. So anyway, um, that's uh, Ed Ireland and uh, his substack, um, if I'm correct, is um, um, Paul, oh my gosh. Isn't it edireland.substack.com? Goodness, I just went blank. Uh, yes, I think it is. Uh, EdIreland.substack.com. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Ed's, Ed's a, a really smart guy, too. He teaches at uh, TCU um, and has for a long time. And uh, it's just been, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a strong voice in energy for a long time. And uh, it's a pleasure to know him. I, I had lunch with him a couple of weeks ago. Really great guy. Oh, wow. Well, if I may, the other thing that that really bugs me about um, uh, not about well that's that's really highlighted in his piece, guys, is how this president promised that hey, if you make four hundred thousand or less, there would be you know no you know just you know no new taxes and you you wouldn't go up. Well, every single one of these taxes, whether it's a tax on crude oil that he highlights, or the one on on uh, methane emissions, or the IRA, the tax on coal. This is all going to affect the middle class of Americans, which is the, right now still, God willing, the majority of Americans. So, um, you know, it's just a darn shame right now what we continue to do here by subsidizing the wrong. And um, and that uh, what I mean wrong, just we're subsidizing something that there are no big returns. In. It's not reliable. It's not efficient. And it's not inexpensive right now. 
Well, it's interesting. The energy minister in Germany, uh, what you just said brings me to a comment that was made by a German, senior German official last week in response to the EU's plans to do a subsidy program of their own. And, and what he said was that, that he strenuously objects to this approach because it amounts to, so to industrial planning similar to the Soviet Union. Hmm. And, and what we're doing is eliminating the free market as the decision maker and turning the government, the federal government, into the decision maker on what energy projects do and don't get funded. And, uh, you know, I mean, and we've all talked about it a lot on this podcast. I've written a ton about it since last summer when it became obvious that the IRA was going to be enacted. And, um, you know, I mean, you see what's getting subsidized and and those are the projects that are going to be funded. And uh, in the meantime, we have this half trillion dollar deficit in in investing and finding and producing new reserves of oil to meet global demand that just keeps rising. And uh, at some point, you're going to have a big train wreck and, uh, and an enormous explosion in energy costs, not just for the upper class, as, but as RT says, for everybody. Yeah. I, and that's I, no I, difference that's than it. a text. Drop Did I roll y'all to Drop sleep? Come on, that's somebody it. talk. <laughs> I, I, no, I'm sitting here going, uh, the one thing I also noticed over, uh, speaking of compressed uh, natural gas for uh, school buses, I have to give a shout out to uh, India. They've got a major push over the last uh, three years or four years on uh, bio con- uh, uh, compressed natural gas. And they're putting these plants, I believe they have 20 already in operation for putting them next to farms. And they're actually oh. putting uh bio from you know the farms and everything sure, else. the feedlots yeah yeah, yeah yeah absolutely right. all the, wonderful all the cattle yeah. byproducts yeah. give them a shout out man i thought that was absolutely wonderful because we ought to do the same thing Why we are not? doing the same thing in the united states uh, all the big waste management companies have programs just like right. that here in the united and big in the huge landfills you bet. I like. Uh, yep. I interviewed Deborah Wald uh, with Green Lonely Energy, and she's got those. Yep, fabulous. Anyway, sorry. We got about five more minutes, uh, guys. Give me your thoughts for the rest of this week, other than President Trump being arrested. Uh, we'll leave that one alone. Okay. I was like, do you think uh, he is though? I think. I think. I think. I don't know. We'll be interested to see if he does. Yes, it will be very interesting. That's for sure. It's going to I, dominate the news all week. I I cannot believe that they're that stupid. Um, it if oh, it there's does, no depths to to the stupidity. You know, it, if it does, you almost want to think that it's an intentional uh, movement to a civil war. Um, and I I just can't believe that if they do, but if they do do that. Uh, DeSantis may lose and Trump may be immediately the, uh, Republican nominee. And I almost believe it will hand the election to Trump. So I have mixed emotions, civil war or hand it to (laughs) Trump. I don't know. (laughs) Well, that may be their motivation. They're so afraid of DeSantis. They want to encourage the Trump I, nomination. I don't know about DeSantis or Trump. What do you guys think? I like them both. I mean, that's what gets me all goofy. I, I think they're both. Yeah, no, I think DeSantis uh, would be a great option. However, I don't think he's going to have the time. And this is what I mean by that. Um, I have a feeling, and this is just, of course, my guess, that it's going to be a Trump-Haley ticket. Uh, Nikki Haley, uh, you know, went off to the UN, so she got her global experience. Um, and yeah. if she, w- if they win, and if they continue, then you could see Nikki Haley becoming president down the road, which would then mean that Ron DeSantis would have missed his opportunity to run for president. Now, granted, he'll still be, you know, in his late or what late sixties, early seventies, so maybe so. But um, but no, I think his opportunity is right now, and I just don't think it'll be there. Um, I mean, shoot, the other thought, I, I and I have no problem with it, would be Mike Pence. I, he did a great job 
as vice president, and <clears throat> he I, he held his own. I and disagree. He believed and and stood his yeah. Well, that's okay, but he stood his ground and 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 kept in his firm and his convictions and his belief. And um, I, I I admire that. I, I think that's something that 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 was good. And um, so so, but we'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm, Pence Pence is Jeb Bush. Okay, 2016. He's not even going to make it out of the first few months of primaries if he runs. So. <laughs> I think Ron DeSantis will be the nominee and the next president. That's what I think. I I have no clue in it. You know, I, I understand the Democrats' motivation for, for arrest, wanting to arrest Trump and all that. I, I think it's just one of these idiotic schemes that isn't going to work. And, uh, wow. you know, I, I just think that uh, Ron DeSantis is, is going to be the nominee and will win the general election. All right. RT, how you do heard we it here first. You? Yeah, I know. <laughs> how I was do we find you heard you? it right here on three podcasters walk into a bar. Uh, 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 and uh, David, the the the, the David, David Blackman buddy, is. <laughs> 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 I can't even talk here. David Blackman is uh, putting his hat in the ring for Ron DeSantis in 2024. I, I and I'm going to put my hat in the ring for. I have no clue. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to do a shout out to Ryan Ray. Uh, Ryan Ray, 2024. There we go. I, Ryan I Ray, think, there you go. I'm for it. Uh, I would vote for Ryan Ray in two and a half seconds because I'm going to be the uh, uh, Secretary of Energy if I you, he, you know, I think he does owe you a favor. So, yes, yeah, he does. I say do it. <laughs> I want to be the Commissioner of Lighthouses in whatever administration there is. There's actually a job at the Interior Department called the Commissioner of Lighthouses. And I want that job because it is the cushiest, most do nothing job in the world. And I'm ready to retire. <laughs> you okay. Can, Y'all yeah. heard it right there. Hey, we'd like to thank all of our folks and all of our listeners because this podcast is going bonkers. Yeah. David, how do people find you real quick? Man, I don't even know anymore. Substack, Substack, blackman.substack.com and uh, Forbes.com. I, I write for the Daily Caller now the as well. Energy and question on the all energy question podca- on all podcasts. And and the energy transition podcast as well. And that's showing up on starting to show up on like Stitcher and Apple and all that kind of good stuff. And then we have the crude truth. How do we find you, RT? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, um, you can find me at a Pecos Country Operating. Uh, you can find me at the crude truth.com. Um, um, all of my stuff is on social and I'm in the Twitter world at uh, truth underscore crew. And uh, so please reach out um, and, you know, just uh, like and subscribe, not only to three podcasters, but if, if by some chance you haven't listened to the Energy Newsbeat Daily Show that's done every morning, I recommend that. And every Monday is the Energy Transition, uh, where you get to hear a live um, broadcast of not only uh, America's views on what's going on in the energy world, but the world's view with people like Irina Slav, Tammy Namath, Armand Cavale, and some little guy named David Blackman. Um, <laughs> and because who are we kidding? The uh, oil and gas is a global commodity, and we need to know the crude truth on what's going on around the world. So Outstanding, guys. Outstanding. Real quick, for the energy transition, I want to share uh, everybody that you're now in 53 countries. Uh, you have in your live show, you have Brazil, the country of Texas, uh, <laughs> Dallas, uh, you have London and you have Bulgaria. Your uh, podcast is going bonkers in 53 countries. That's awesome. nuts. Have a great one, guys. And this was the three podcasters a stroll into a bar. Mm-hmm.